So Elaine, please. Yes, I just wanted to say that I'm very honored to be invited as a guest for you. Um, I noted that Doug Tallamy, the entomologist, was a very recent speaker for you. And um, I'm honored to follow in his footsteps. He is a hero of mine. And what I basically do in my educational presentations is to take the general principles that he's sharing about sustainability, native plants, and uh, providing for our wildlife, and to show people practical examples of how they can do that in their own gardens. We're really excited to have you. Thank you yep. so much. That was exactly what I was looking for on YouTube when I stumbled across your presentation. And uh, I, it's the the principle, yeah, I get it. We need to put um, natives in our yard. And there's a whole lot of, uh, how do I do that? So <laughs> I was so glad to find so much in-depth information. And I've been poking around uh, the Master Gardener's website, and there's so much more there. I feel like it's going to take me a couple of years to, uh, to get through the, the content that's already available. We'll look forward to seeing you at the break between the two segments. Enjoy, everybody, and we're so glad to have you with us. Welcome, everyone, to another presentation in our Sustainable Landscaping series. Today, I'll begin by answering some basic questions about ground covers. We'll briefly discuss problems with some invasive species and the reasons why I would recommend instead using native species of ground covers. For the bulk of the presentation, I'll be introducing a wide variety of plants, 21 for sun, 20 for shade, and four plants that can grow in a range of sun exposures. I'll take questions at a midway point and then at the end, and I'll also be briefly introducing some helpful resources. We think of ground covers as plants with a creeping spreading habit. They're used to cover sections of the ground and they generally require minimal maintenance. But I would like to introduce the idea that you might want to consider some somewhat taller species of plants to help expand the palette of plants you can choose from. We think of ground covers, first of all, as being used where turf doesn't grow well, on slopes or other areas that are difficult to mow. It can be used as edging in borders and along paths, under shrubs and trees, even between pavers, and a range of sun exposures, hell strips, those hot, dry curbsides, or on the other extreme, in rain gardens. Ground covers serve a number of functions. They can be the ground layer in a multi-layered garden. They can reduce maintenance in our gardens as a green mulch. Many people use them as a lawn alternative, taking away all these extra tasks that are associated with grass. Ground covers cool the ground and help retain moisture. They reduce soil compaction and erosion and filter and slow rainwater, a particular concern these days with uh, our heavier rainstorms. And additionally, ground covers can add beauty and interest. Unfortunately, there is a group of ground covers that continue to be popular and available, yet they are invasive. These are some that are designated as invasive in our Northern Virginia area, but they expand well beyond that. If you want to learn the particular problems associated with them, you can follow the links on the handout that I've provided. Plants are designated as invasive when they meet the qualifications of this presidential executive order from 1999. They are non-native species that are introduced into an environment. They can escape from cultivation in our gardens into natural areas, and there they can cause harm to the environment. And they do that in a number of ways. They spread by prolific seeds and rampant vegetative growth. They can produce dense monocultures, thereby suppressing the native herbaceous plants. Some of them may even climb and smother and kill our trees. They can exude chemicals, having an allelopathic effect on the growth of other plants. Even small fragments can root to form new plants, and some of them harbor rats, mosquitoes, mice, and ticks that spread disease. 
I would recommend instead that you consider using some of the native ground covers I'm going to be introducing. These are suited to our local soil and climate. They may be aggressive, but they are not invasive. They're not going to affect the success of other native plants in our natural areas. These native plants have evolved with local fauna. They can provide nectar and pollen for our pollinators. Some serve as what we term host plants for Lepidoptera. They're going to offer nourishment for the caterpillar stage of butterflies and moths. They can provide fruit and seeds for wildlife, and some of them offer cover for a variety of animals. Moving right along, we'll be looking first at low-growing perennials for sun. And I'm going to be introducing all of these plants in each subsection in bloom sequence. You'll notice for each of them that there will be this green text box. And if you follow the links that I've provided on the handout, you will be taken to what we refer to as the tried and true fact sheets that we prepared on each of these plants. As we're going through, I may just hit the high points for some of these, but all of this information, in addition to many details on the care of these plants can be found on these fact sheets. So let's begin with moss phlox, phlox subulata. This plant is very popular in the horticulture trade and many people don't even realize that it is a native plant. This really meets the initial definition of ground cover in that it's a very low, dense, mat forming perennial, only four to six inches high, but it spreads about one to two feet wide, grows in sun, and is very tolerant of those drought conditions. Moss phlox has evergreen needle-like leaves that really carpet and help stabilize soil. You'll sense these fragrant tubular flowers from March to May, and they're available in many colors, providing important early season nectar. Moss phlox is attractive when draped over a wall. It's also useful for edging, for rock and water-wise gardens, and erosion control, and a great replacement for invasive periwinkle. Wild pink. Silene caroliniana is somewhat more mounded as well as mat forming, a little taller at six to 12 inches, and it will also spread eventually by stolons, uh, even a little wider than six to 12 inches. It also likes sun to part sun and does well in those same drought and shallow rocky soil conditions. Wild pink begins its growth with evergreen basal leaves and you'll see abundant tubular flowers from April to May. This is another important early nectar source for a variety of our pollinators. And another great replacement for invasive periwinkle. In my garden, I've used it as an edging in beds. You could also add it to rock gardens. It will spread by ground level stems. They're referred to as stolons and it will maintain its form through the winter. Plant and leaf pussy toes, Antonaria plantaginifolia, it's another mat forming plant, also semi evergreen. It's only about two inches high, although it will reach 10 inches when it's in bloom, but it spreads significantly over about one to two feet. This one particularly requires lean, dry soil and full sun. It begins growth with these woolly grayish leaves, and this foliage will provide nourishment for the American painted lady butterfly. Male and female flowers will appear on 10 inch flower stalks, and they're absolutely charming. They bloom from April to May, attracting small bees and flies, and really looking a great deal like kitten's paws. I find that this particular species spreads to form a weedless mat, and it's excellent for dry, shallow, rocky soils. Here it is. I've used it as an edging in my garden, and uh, this photo was taken several years ago, so it's really expanded even beyond this, replacing some of the other non-native ground covers that appear in that photo. This is said to tolerate light foot traffic. Julie on chat has mentioned to me that she likes using another species of pussy toes, Antonaria neglecta. 
And either one of those would be a great substitute for invasive creeping jenny. Another low growing ground cover is blue eyed grass, Cicerynchium angustifolium. This plant has dense tufted expanding clumps. They're going to be a little bit taller, 10 to 12 inches high and can spread uh, up to about a foot across. These grow in sun to part shade and they, unlike the others we've been mentioning, are going to require consistently moist, well-drained soil. It's called blue-eyed grass, but it's actually a member of the iris family with the typical narrow sword-shaped leaves. It has these charming blue flowers from April to May that draw native bees and flower flies and makes a great edging for borders and pathways. You may be surprised to learn that there is a cactus that's native to the East Coast, Eastern Prickly Pear, Opuntia humifusa. This is a clumping, low-growing cactus, about six to 12 inches high, and it can spread as much as three feet across. This will be another plant for full sun and well-drained soil, and it's intolerant of shade. This is actually fairly easy to grow. It can even root from pads that are stuck in the ground. Eastern prickly pear has bright flowers from June to July. Each one of them will only bloom for a single day, but they will attract butterflies and bees. Birds and humans can enjoy the edible pads referred to as nopales and the fruit tunas in the fall. And Julie is going to put a link in the chat that will give you information about the preparations of those plant parts if you would like to consume them. When you plant Eastern prickly pear, you definitely want to beware of thorns and the barbed bristles that are referred to as glockids. Prickly pear is great for use in water-wise gardens and hell strips and also very attractive in rock gardens and on walls, even spilling over very attractively. Many of you may be familiar with the light and airy heath aster, Symphiotrichum ericoides. This is snow flurry, a prostrate form of this three foot species. It's very dense and branching with somewhat woody stems. It's only about four to six inches high, but it will spread significantly wider, about two to four feet across. This likes sun and dry soil and is tolerant of drought and black walnut. It has stiff and linear basal leaves that will emerge in March. And then the leaves on the stems are needle-like and they have somewhat the look of heather or ground cover juniper. In September to October, you'll see very dense sprays of daisy-like white flowers. They attract a wide variety of pollinators. Snow flurry will create a weed-free mat, excellent for border fronts and edging. Mount Cuba recommends its use in rock gardens and water-wise landscapes. And I've used it myself as the so-called spiller in containers, the plant that's going to drape over the edge. Now let's take a look at some taller perennials for sun, one foot or taller. And again, I'll be introducing these in the sequence in which they would bloom in your garden. The first is Robin's plantain, Origeron pulchellus. This is a stoloniferous plant. That means it's going to spread by those above ground stems. It grows about 18 to 24 inches tall and wide. It will grow in sun, but it prefers light shade in a hot climate. And it prefers lean, limey soils. It has soft, hairy basal leaves, and these will provide nourishment for several moth species. These showy flowers will appear in April attracting pollinators, and you may see them sometimes in this lavender variant. Fluffy seed heads appear shortly thereafter. Robin's plantain can spread to form colonies via those stolons, and it's useful in borders and rock gardens. 
Lynn Haven carpet is a naturally occurring variant, and it's very popular because of its somewhat larger leaves and very dense mat forming habit. Lyre leaf sage, Salvia lirata, has an upright clumping habit, fairly dense. The flower stalks are about one to two feet tall, and the base is about nine to 12 inches across. Another one for full sun, dry to moist soil, uh, fairly uh, tolerant of a wide variety of conditions in the garden. Lyre leaf sage grows from a basal rosette. It's evergreen and somewhat purple tinged along the veins. Purple knockout is a popular cultivar where the entire leaf will have a maroon or purple color. These lovely lavender tubular flowers appear from April to June, providing nectar for native bees. Lyre leaf sage has interesting seed heads, and these seeds are consumed by doves. The plant reseeds prolifically to form a fairly solid evergreen cover. It can take mowing and foot traffic. If you want to control the spread, you would just simply trim those tall seed heads. And the plant is also easily uprooted. I sometimes find it volunteering in one part of my garden. I simply uproot it and move it to a part where I would like it to grow. This would be a great substitute for invasive ajuga. Threadleaf coreopsis. Coryopsis verticillata has a very open, airy habit and spreads slowly. It's a little taller, 30 to 36 inches tall by two to three feet wide. It can grow in sun to part shade, dry to moist soil, and tolerates drought, heat, and humidity, even salt, but not waterlogged soils. This plant will spread both by rhizomes and self-seeding, it has this lovely fine textured foliage and yellow flowers all the way from June to September, offering a nectar source for pollinators and seeds for birds. Coryopsis is excellent for use in hell strips. Here's a photo from one of our demonstration gardens. It's in the hell strip of the sunny demonstration garden. It's also an excellent edging plant for borders. Zagreb is a popular cultivar because of its uniform habit. And moonbeam is selected by some for its pale yellow color and long period of bloom. You can see a report on threadleaf coreopsis in the Mount Cuba research report. Clustered mountain mint is one of a number of mountain mints. This is Pycnanthema muticum. It's a clump forming plant that will spread by rhizomes. The flower stalks are one to three feet tall and spread about the same distance. It grows in sun to part shade, uh, tolerates drought, but it prefers moist soil. Mountain mint has aromatic leaves. It can be used for tea. You'll see these white flowers from June to September, and they are bordered by the lovely silvery bracts that add a cool sensation to the garden. And there's continuing winter interest with these textured seed heads. Mountain mint can add textural contrast in beds and hell strips, and you might want to mass it in a butterfly garden. In pollinator trials that were conducted by Penn State Extension, this particular plant was rated number one for flower longevity, as well as the diversity and total number of pollinators. I'd like to take a moment to speak about several of the goldenrods, members of the Solidago species. These have been singled out by entomologist Doug Tallamy because he rates them as the number one herbaceous keystone genus. This is because of the large number of species of Lepidoptera, butterflies, and moths that can be hosted by these plants. This means that the foliage of these plants is going to provide the important nourishment for the caterpillars of these species. 
we like to see the adults, but we want to make sure that they can continue to multiply. And so this is a good example of a genus of plants that will help in that regard. The golden rods have various habits. The ones I'm going to be mentioning will grow one to three feet tall and wide. They grow in sun to part shade, some in dry and some in wet soil. The first is rough stemmed golden rod. I'm particularly singling out the fireworks cultivar of Solidago rugosa. This has plume-like zigzag panicles on stiff stems, and you can see how it appears to have that fireworks appearance. I particularly use a technique of pinching them back beginning maybe in May and pinching them several times up until about July. That way I can control the height, and this makes a very nice, very effective ground cover surrounding for one of the shrubs in my front yard. Blue stemmed golden rod, Solidago casea, is maybe my favorite of the golden rods. It has a very graceful habit and is a nice border plant for dry woodland edges. You'll see these loose flower clusters on arching stems, and they will provide great uh, late nectar source all the way from August into October. So important for our pollinators as well as for the butterflies and moths. You might also want to consider false golden rod, Solidago sfasilata. Golden fleece has been singled out as particularly attractive. You'll see these uh, wider panicles on stiff multi-branch stems. This particular golden rod has distinctive rosettes of heart-shaped basal leaves. This will create a mat-like ground cover for rock gardens, meadows, and naturalized areas. Doug Tellamy has singled out asters as the number two herbaceous keystone genus, supporting 112 species of Lepidoptera. My favorite is aromatic aster, Symphiotrichum oblongifolium. The reason I like this particular one is it doesn't have that tall, leggy, gangly shape that other species such as New England aster have. This has a bushy, mounding, globe-shaped habit. It will grow only about one to three feet tall and wide. It likes sun and dry conditions. Aromatic aster, true to its name, has aromatic leaves on densely branched stems. This is a fabulous late pollen and nectar source all the way from August into even mid-November. Radon's favorite has been singled out as a popular cultivar. It was top rated by a Chicago Botanic Garden after a long period of study. And October Skies is another popular cultivar. This has a more compact and dense habit. Aromatic aster slowly colonizes by stolons, those above ground stems. And you can see how it creates a really dense, low maintenance planting for slopes. You might also want to use it in rock gardens or in the front of borders, as we do at our local Glen Carlin demonstration garden. This could be a great native substitute for chrysanthemums. Moving on, let's take a quick look at some grasses and rushes for sun. The first is little blue stem, Schizocarium scoparium. This is a clumping warm season grass. That means that it will get a somewhat later start in the growing season. It grows about two to four feet tall, one and a half feet to two feet across. This plant is definitely going to prefer the sun and the dry conditions that it, it would have in its original native area in the tall grass prairie. It is really intolerant of flooding. It's going to flop if it receives too much moisture or if the soil is too rich. Little blue stem has erect stems with light blue-green leaves, and its flower heads will change through the seasons. There'll be lovely silvery white seed heads. Then the leaves themselves will change to a bronze color in the fall, and that will last through the winter. Little blue stem is an important larval host for skippers. It provides protective cover for small animals, as well as seeds for birds. 
little blue stem has many landscape uses. You can mass it in an ornamental planting. Its deep root system can help control erosion on slopes, and it can serve as the structural layer in meadows. Common or soft rush, Juncus effusus, is an upright plant that spreads by rhizomes. It's about two to four feet tall and wide, another plant that likes full sun. But this one, by contrast to the little blue stem, prefers wet, consistently moist soil, and it can even grow in standing water up to four inches deep. This is an evergreen plant. It has smooth, leafless, spire-like stems and these golden brown flowers from July to September. This could serve as an important central component of a rain garden and control erosion on moist banks. River oats, Chesmanthium latifolium, is an upright clumping cool season grass. It can range from two to five feet tall and spreads about two to three feet across. It can grow from sun all the way to part shade and dry to wet soil. An alert, this plant spreads fairly aggressively. It does serve as the larval host for a skipper. River oats is interesting in that it has attractive seed heads through the seasons. In July, it will be particularly attractive backlit by the light. In August, you'll see it maturing to pink and then tan. And in September, the seed heads will continue to provide winter interest. Because of its aggressive spread, it can serve very effectively for erosion control on slopes. You can mass it in borders and rain gardens and use it in hell strips. Now let's take a look at some woody plants for sun. Creeping juniper, Juniperus horizontalis, has a sprawling mat forming habit. This is a shrub. It grows only about six to 18 inches tall, but it spreads very wide, five to eight feet across. This will grow in full sun and moist soil, although it's tolerant of drought and poor rocky soil and pollution. This is an evergreen plant. Just an alert, the members of the Juniperus genus will serve as alternate hosts for rust disease. So if you have a plant in the apple, pear, quince family, the rose family, something in that family, a shrub or a tree like serviceberry, you need to be alert that this could cause a growth to form on the fruit. It's not going to kill those plants, but it would be somewhat unsightly. Creeping juniper has green to blue-green foliage. It turns purplish in winter, and it forms a dense, wide mat, great for foundations, rock gardens, hell strips, or erosion control on slopes. Some of us are familiar with fragrant sumac, Rus aromatica, the straight species that grows about six feet tall. Here, for ground cover purposes, I'm introducing the Grow Low cultivar. This has a very dense habit. It's low growing, only about a foot and a half to three feet tall, but it can spread quite wide, six to eight feet across. It can grow in sun to part shade, dry to moist soil, and as is consistent with some of these other ground covers I've been introducing, tolerates drought and shallow rocky soil. You'll see this glossy aromatic foliage. Note that although it's in the same genus as a poison ivy, this is non-toxic foliage. Male catkins appear on the plant from summer through winter. And then you'll see these female flowers in April attracting pollinators. When they are pollinated, they'll result in this fuzzy fruit that is attractive for the birds. Fragrant sumac has a brilliant fall color. This particular plant works very well as a foundation plant. One of my master gardener colleagues uses it as a green mulch under her trees and shrubs. This plant can spread, as I've mentioned, by suckering to form a, a very attractive low hedge. 
The plant is also excellent for bank stabilization. This is a church parking lot where I recommended that it be planted. And you can see how it has spread. The first photo was taken when it was first put in. And this is what it looks like just a, about a month ago. So it can really handle those hell strip conditions. Another lovely shrub that you might use as a ground cover is shrubby St. John's wort, Hypericum prolificum. It's compact and mound shaped, grows about one to four feet tall and wide. This grows in sun, two part shade, and likes moist soil, although it will tolerate a variety of conditions all the way from drought to brief flooding. This plant has fine textured foliage and serves as a larval host for Lepidoptera. The flowers do not produce nectar, but they're very showy. You'll see them from June to August, and they offer abundant pollen for bees and flies. Later, you'll see cone-shaped capsules, and they're attractive when they dry to brown, lasting through into the wintertime. Shrubby St. John's wort is a densely branched plant, and it's useful when grouped on a slope for erosion control and you might enjoy massing it in a wildlife garden. Gray owl red cedar is a cultivar of the familiar tall red cedar tree. This is a vase shaped shrub with a spreading habit. It grows about two to three feet tall and spreads across five to six feet. It likes full sun and moist soil, although it tolerates a range of conditions. It's evergreen, and as with the other creeping juniper, this is an alternate host for that rust disease I mentioned. Gray owl is a dioecious species. That means that there are separate male and female plants. You'll see these flowers on the female plants in May, and then berry-like cones through the winter will be eaten by birds. Gray owl is noted for its silvery gray scale-like foliage. And this particular genus is best known for its drought resistance, more tolerant than any other conifer that's native to the Eastern US. Gray owl has attractive arching branches, very effective when massed, and it's useful for dry, sunny sites. We'll take a look at that handful of ground covers that can grow in a range of sun exposures all the way from sun to shade. The first are the violets, and there are a number of them that are locally native. They have a mounding habit. They're generally about six to nine inches tall and spread about a foot across. They can bloom as early as March. Here are the species that are locally native, common blue, the Confederate variant, yellow violets, and striped. And all of these are good sources of spring nectar for our pollinators. Additionally, violets can serve as larval hosts to 30 species of fritillaries, that particular subcategory of butterflies. They can spread to form a natural woodland ground cover. And I personally allow them to volunteer in my yard and I use them as a green mulch under woody plants. If they pop up in an area where I don't want them to grow, I simply uproot them and then move them to create this nice dense ground cover. Golden ragwort, Pacara aurea, is highly recommended by our local Audubon at Home Ambassadors, and you'll see why as I discuss it. This is a clump forming plant. The basal leaves are only six inches high, but it will be 30 inches tall with the bloom. The individual plants are about six to 18 inches across. This can grow all the way from sun to shade and moist to wet soil, and it's evergreen. Golden ragwort has glossy basal leaves. They provide nourishment for 18 species of Lepidoptera. You'll see these purple buds in the spring, and surprisingly, they will open up into these bright yellow daisy-like flower clusters. They bloom for about three weeks in April. They're very attractive to bees and butterflies. 
Now, golden ragwort can spread both by self-seeding and basal offshoots that can allow it to be a really excellent ground cover spreading across a wide area. But if you want to control the spread, you would simply trim those seed stalks in late April before they've had a chance to really blow in the wind. Golden ragwort has numerous landscape uses. Here it is used as an edging for a pathway, front of a border. It makes a great impact when used en masse. You can allow it to naturalize in woodland areas. It can serve as a green mulch under shrubs, and it's an excellent plant for erosion control on slopes. It's really the ideal substitute for invasive English ivy. Another great plant for sun to shade conditions is Golden Alexander's Zizia aurea. This has an erect branching habit. It reaches from 18 to 36 inches tall, 18 to 24 inches wide. It tends to like a moist soil. Golden Alexander's has compound leaves with toothed leaflets. It's the host plant for swallowtail butterflies. You'll see these flat-topped flower clusters in April. They are easily accessible for a variety of pollinators for pollen and nectar. Seed heads will form in summer and are very attractive even when they dry. Golden Alexanders can be used as a green mulch under shrubs and trees. As I've said, it self-seeds fairly easily, so it creates a really nice edging in a layered garden. This is along a woodland path in my backyard. Great substitute for invasive bishop's weed. Another plant that grows well in a range of sun conditions is alum root, Hucura villosa, and I'm particularly singling out the Autumn Bride cultivar because of how showy its flowers are and the fact that its foliage is evergreen. It has a rounded clumping form. It grows about 18 to 36 inches tall and 18 to 24 inches across. This one you'll want to keep moist in order to avoid decline. As I mentioned, it has large leaves. Uh, these are lobed and toothed, and they will remain even through snow and ice in the winter. You'll see airy panicles, very large, from June to October, attracting bees and butterflies. And then even as they dry out, they form these striking seed heads that will last all the way through the winter. Autumn Bride can be used en masse in a woodland to control erosion. Here's how we use it as a foundation planting in our Glen Carlin demonstration garden. And one of my master gardener colleagues uses it as a base under shrubs and an edging for walkways. So welcome back everybody. And Elaine, if you would be kind enough to unmute yourself there and turn on your video. Here, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yes, let's see if I can get my... And I'm asking you to start your video. There you go. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Wonderful. Before, before we get started, let's just remind everybody if you want to turn your video back on now you're more than welcome to if you have a problem doing that and you want to do that uh it may be that we've turned it off in which case you need to mention that in the chat and if you have questions please put them into the q and a module at the bottom of the screen we invite you to stay because we're doing the questions about the sun oriented plants and then we're going to show the second half of the presentation about the shade plants so um, we have please stick around because now elaine is our resident expert who is here to answer questions so um elaine do you have any comments before we jump into questions yeah yes i do um i would like to say that I am a master gardener in Northern Virginia. So I'm speaking 
from my experience, um, generally the fact sheets that we've created are intended to cover plants throughout the entire Mid-Atlantic. Now I understand that tonight there are participants from other areas. Some I, I don't know if you noticed, but above the green text boxes um, in small type, I was indicating the native range of the plants. So some of them will grow well beyond the uh, the mid-Atlantic, uh, even all the way to um, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, uh, down, some of them down into the southeast. So um, I hope that additional information will be, will be helpful for those who are maybe uh, attending from a different area. Um, and one thing I'd like to mention about the keystone plants, uh, there were two genuses, uh, two genera that I mentioned, the, um, the goldenrods and the asters. Not only are these going to allow the, cater the full life cycle of butterflies and moths. But as Doug Tellamy points out in, in his work, this caterpillar stage is critical because caterpillars are, in a sense, at the base of food webs in our gardens. 96% of our birds, for example, will rely solely on caterpillars to feed their young. And so if, um, if the caterpillars aren't there, the birds won't be there. Uh, Doug Tellamy talks about um, an ideal percentage of native plants in our gardens. Um, and this, uh, they arrived at the ideal figure of 70% of native plants in studies that uh, were conducted in the Washington, D.C. area a number of years back. And they found that gardens that had this higher percentage of, of um, native plants, particularly the woody plants, the trees and the shrubs, were going to provide the caterpillars, which would then in turn support um, the birds. I have um, on our Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website an entire presentation that's all about the, the top keystone plants, the top 10 woody plants, and the top uh, 10 genera of herbaceous plants. So if folks are interested in learning more about that, that's the only presentation that I'm aware of that anyone has ever done focusing just on the keystone plants. So I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that are available in the chat or the Q&A rather. Elaine, is that um, presentation about the Keystone plants on uh, YouTube as well, or is it just uh, a- yeah, um... yeah, yes. It's advertised on our website in what we refer to as the Master Gardener Virtual Classroom under the Education Menu tab. But we also have the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia MG NV YouTube channel. So they can be viewed either place. By going to the website, you would find handouts and other resources that supplement and the way the handout tonight allows you to follow along. Going to the website will give you those resources, but you can press a button that allows you to view it um, on the YouTube channel. Awesome, thanks. Is it possible to post the link to that presentation and also to your website, Elaine? Uh, can I do it? I um, Let's see. Well, mgnv.org is the website. Um, since I've got the Zoom up, it's not quite as handy to, to get to it. I don't know if Scott can yeah, off, I'll put it on off, there off sure. screen. Yeah. So look, look in the Master Gardener Virtual Classroom under the Education Menu tab at mgnv.org. And you should be able to um, find the uh, keystone. There's a whole section on native plants and keystone uh, species is, is there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So I've gone through the uh, questions and the most upvoted question so far is from Laura Crago or Crago. I apologize, Laura, if I've mispronounced um, and she says, I notice you use slash recommend quite a few cultivars, yet popularly among native plant enthusiasts, these cultivars are looked down upon, even dismissed. What argument do you make to the purists who insist only on, quote, clean, unquote, natives? 
Well, in general, I recommend the the so-called straight species, the wild type of the plants. Um, in some cases, I was just mentioning that there are these, these cultivars that are available. In fact, I've been very interested in delving deeper in this topic, and I'm currently at work on a presentation that's going to look at some very important studies that have been done, kind of... Um, showing their plant trials in some cases, taking straight species and cultivars uh, head to head and comparing them. In some of the plant trials, I'm thinking of Annie White's uh, trials at, at the University of Vermont. She found, for example, that uh, there were some cultivars that actually outperformed the uh, the straight species in terms of the numbers of pollinators that were coming. But in this talk that I'm working on, I'm going to be looking at things that we don't really think about. Um, sometimes the whole profile of the nectar and the pollen can, can be different between the cultivars and the straight species. So the um, Insects, there might be a lot of insects that come to both, but the types of insects may be different. Um, I've just been in correspondence with some folks at the um, at Oregon State University, and they've been looking at, at things that we don't even think about, like the UV patterns that are on the petals that can affect the attraction for the insects. Um, Annie White has looked at how the abundance of nectar can vary even though the flower color seems to be the same. So I agree, we, we want to be careful and those who want to go with just the straight species, I, I think there's a strong argument for that. The, the more a plant has been modified, the less likely it is to provide the full range of ecosystem services that the straight species do. Thank you for that answer. There was another question that I think you already answered, which is, do you think the cultivars or is, is it said native ours? Yes, that's a, a, sometimes an alternate term. Mm -hmm. Okay, have the same quality of nectar and pollen. So you address that. Yes. Um, j just in general, we say for the woody plants, if the foliage color has been modified, that means that the chemistry has been changed. And those plants can no longer be used as host plants for the caterpillar stage of the Lepidoptera. In general, we say with the herbaceous plants, if the flower form has been changed, especially let's think of um, echinacea, um, Echinacea purpurea, purple coneflower, such a popular plant in the horticulture trade. It probably has more cultivars than any other plant I can think of. The more changes that are made away from those mauve ray petals, uh, ray flowers, and that central um, disc cone, um, that means that you won't have the nectaries, you won't have the nectar and pollen. The, the flowers are essentially sterile and, and they're just not going to, to offer those ecosystem um, services. Um, another plant that has a lot of cultivars um, is, is um, hydrangea arborescens, our wild hydrangea. And Many people are so familiar with our age, Asian hydrangeas that have the big, showy mop head flower clusters. And when, when the hydrangea arborescens has cultivars of that type, those flowers are beautiful for us, but, but they're sterile. Just another general comment about straight, straight species versus cultivars. Cultivars are really devised, they're developed with in in many cases with gardeners in mind what's going to be attractive to us shape wise or color wise the horticulturists aren't always the they aren't always thinking about the benefit for um for our wildlife thank you uh let's see there is uh okay i from laura crago I recently view, viewed another YouTube video in which the horticulturist mentioned that ground covers provide important root competition 
in native gardens. This competition helps larger natives to push their roots vertically into the ground rather than horizontally. This pressure helps larger natives to stand up rather than to flop over. So what percentage of native ground covers should be planted in an all native garden? Okay, there ha is an excellent book um, on planting in a post wild world that is written, uh, uh, let's see if I can think of the names of the authors, uh, Tom, Thomas Rainier, uh, a landscape designer, and Claudia Vest. Um, and they ha discuss in detail what they describe as the different layers. They talk about structural layer plants, those tall, very uh, robust plants. They talk about the seasonal plants, the ones that are going to provide the color and the interest, um, the blooms as we go through the seasons. I think, as I recall, if I recall correctly, they're talking about having about 50% of the plants in a garden bed being these low-growing ground cover type plants. So check that book out, uh, uh, Growing in a Post or Gardening in a Post Wild World. Um, it, a title, something similar to that by Rainier and West. Um, really excellent, goes into great detail about how the roots are going to reach down to different depths and how plants work together in plant communities. And great. I just put a link to Thomas Rainier's um, blog uh, and the page about the book into the chat if anybody needs it. I'm lucky in that he lives about a block away from me. And his his own personal garden is lovely. What fun! <laughs> we, we have several questions about phlox. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is phlox subulata mm -hmm. creeping phlox native to Ohio? I'm just going to say them all. Um, uh, how can moss phlox be rejuvenated once it stops blooming after a number of years, and how fast does it spread? Okay. Um, I have to admit, I don't remember exactly what its full native range is. Um, but if you uh, look back at the recording, you'll see that little line that I put above the text box that shows I, I listed the, nat the native range. And I would, I would think that it would be extending into Ohio, but I'm not absolutely positive. Um, as far as rejuvenation, the recommendation is that if plants um, are, if the leaves aren't, aren't as abundant or if the flowers um, seem to be dying out, that the plant may need to, to be divided. And some plants, they, I think they say generally it's maybe every three to five years. So that it may just need to be divided and get kind of a, a boost of new, of new energy. Um, I'm trying to think how long it's taken my flux to spread. Um, I started out with fairly small plants, maybe just a quart size. And now some of them after, I don't know, maybe four or five years are reaching, you know, multiple feet across. So a really nice, dense uh, ground cover. There just are no weeds growing through that at all. Great plant for sun. Wonderful. Uh, what is meant by lean soil? Lean soil means soil that doesn't have a really high percentage of organic matter. That means that the decaying plant and, and animal remains. The plants that like that lean soil tend to be the ones that grow in um, those meadow uh, field type conditions like in the, in the tall grass prairie of the Midwest. Those plants have really deep roots going 5, 10, 12 feet deep. So the, it's the roots that, that can reach down to get the, the lower moisture. And so when they are overrun with moisture at that upper level, it's, it's just too much for them. One challenging thing, of course, with climate change and some of these very heavy rains is that some of these plants will will be overrun by water, uh, can be beaten down. But you can try to avoid that by maybe trying to pick the, the driest um, spot in your garden, maybe maybe a slope so that the water will will run down and, and the, the, the leaner soil will be kept there. Um, 
for folks who are used to adding a lot of organic matter uh, or fertilizing, that's that would be a no-no for the plants that like it lean. In fact, our native plants having grown in these local conditions do not need fertilizer, uh, ex, uh, supplemental fertilizer added. Great. Thank you. And could you tell us what a health strip is exactly? Yes, that's just a term that refers to the, the median strips, the little um, strips that are maybe a foot or so wide that are right along a curb where you might park your car. It's, so it's between the curb and the sidewalk. Um, and they're called hell strips just because by being next to that asphalt, that concrete, it's, it's a very hot, dry, hellish type condition. So you're going to need to put plants that can take the sun, that can take the, the dry conditions there. Awesome. And Laura Crago says sometimes they're called county strips in the more northern climes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. How about since mountain mint spread, spreads via rhizomes, does it tend to be invasive? Well, remember the term invasive only applies to plants that are non-native uh, to, to the United States, um, those that have come from Asia, Europe, Africa. It, it could be perhaps considered aggressive, but um, I've found that it's fairly, although it does spread laterally, it's fairly shallowly rooted. And I find that I, I can just use um, a tool to kind of cut off the roots where I want it to stop its growth or pull up the sections that I, that I don't want. I can either repot those and move them elsewhere. I can um, offer them at a, at a plant sale, a, a master gardener's plant sale, share them with other folks. So um I, I find that that works pretty well. Um, some people will plant um, plants like that um, or the monardas, other um, native plants that are in the mint family. They'll plant them in containers and they'll use that as a way of corralling them. Okay. Is there a native ground cover that can compete with Bermuda grass? Oh, um, I'd have to think back, I, I know there must have been a question like this when I first gave this presentation, and um, I, I should have access to my notes. It it's just um, can be challenging when you've got that kind of a that kind of a plant. I've got a side question around that. Um, anything that you would put in a place that you just tore English ivy out of to try to establish a foothold before the ivy starts growing back? Um, Yes. In fact, a Master Gardener colleague and I have created an entire um, series of short videos, not 90-minute ones like the presentation we're watching. They're little ten, five to 10-minute videos on a whole bunch of different invasive plants. And English ivy is one of them. And our one of our big recommendations as a replacement was the golden ragwort, Pecora aurea. The reason for that is that it itself is a fairly aggressive plant, so it can spread fairly rapidly to fill in where you've removed the English ivy. Great. So ch check that um, check that out. Um, th there's a whole series. We've done 12 of them so far, have 12 more planned for this year on different invasive plants. Awesome. And those are all up on your YouTube channel as well. Yes, they are. You could type in invasive plant and you'll get the list of, of all of them. We, we're working on bamboo now. We've done, um, we've done porcelain berry. We've done liriope. We've done um, the um, mandina. Just a whole, everything from, from invasive grasses like miscanthus, invasive ground covers like uh, Japanese pachysandra, um, and um, invasive shrubs as well. Someone's mentioning here that they have Bermuda grass coming up in the middle of establish, established flocks, subulata. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, let's see, are all asters keystone species? Um, 
Doug Tallamy lists that entire genus as a keystone genus. So the plant, the, the, the numbers of species um, that are supported may vary from plant to plant within that aster family, but as a whole, they're considered to be very beneficial. Great. Can junipers be used for ground cover? I, I'm sorry, can junipers used for ground cover be pruned? If so, how far can they be pruned back? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I guess I haven't ever had to had to do that. I've just allowed it to grow. Um, so I, 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 I'm not an expert on that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Have the native bars been tested to see if they have the same benefits as the true native species? And I think you were speaking to this earlier, yes? Right. Um, this presentation that I'm talking about that I've been working on is uh, going to be offered, um, let's see, I think it's in, in May. And people who are interested about a month ahead of time can can look and, and sign up if they if they wish uh, to attend, all of our uh, webinars um, on the Master Gardener site are are free. But I'm going to be going into great detail. Looking, there were studies done on woody plants by uh, Doug Tellamy and Emily Baisden. There have been um, the studies I referred to on herbaceous plants by Annie White, uh, and these studies um, at Oregon State that are are very interesting to me. I want to. Be in touch with them and learn a little bit more about those. But I'm going to go in, into a quite a bit of detail, uh, um, showing even how some of the plants were were paired head to head, and how um, and how the straight species compared to to each of a series of cultivars. Okay, um, we've got about seven more questions, and I'm going to run through them as quickly as we can so that we can get to the second half of your presentation. Yes. Uh, do you not consider river oats, chasmanthium latifolium as invasive? Uh, it's ag it's aggressive. It's not invasive. If you use the term literally, it doesn't meet the definition because it is it is a native plant. It's only the invasives that are going to have all of those effects that I described in our in our natural areas. Okay. Um, Mount Cuba Center in Delaware has done many studies on whether or not the cultivars are as attractive to pollinators. Are, are you? I, I'm going to actually be talking about quite a few of those studies in in this presentation, um, and it was one of the Mount Cuba reports on um, on the wild hydrangea that introduced to me the idea that even though a cultivar might attract a similar number of insects to it, the profile could be different. There could be a different type of bee that wouldn't come to the, to the straight species that might all of a sudden be coming, or one that loved the straight species wouldn't be attracted. So sometimes we don't really know. It's kind of the the law of unintended consequences. We don't always know what the impacts are. We what we see with our eyes isn't always what's happening, you know, under the surface. So these next two questions are very closely related to what you were just discussing. How can I tell if existing plants are st are straight species or cultivars? Heather, asters, echinacea, spiderwort, in particular. Uh, well, obviously, the best place to start is when you're buying a plant to see exactly how it's labeled. Does it just have that two-part scientific name, the genus and the species? The cultivars will be indicated um, in, in between single quotes. Some of them, in addition, will have patents. Uh, patent numbers and patent names associated with them, but sometimes it will it would be hard to tell if you were just looking at a plant, you know, which one it was, um, without without a plant label and and seeing the provenance of the plant at a nursery. Okay. Do you know of anyone who's modifying cultivars to appeal specifically to pollinators rather than to pretty for people? Well. 
so actually, that one point to be made is that some of the plants that are named as cultivars are are naturally occurring variants of the straight species. One example I can think of, um, well, the Linhaven uh, carpet that I mentioned is one. It it just showed up, um, I think, in in um, around the Norfolk, Virginia area. Um, Gina, J-E-A-N-A, -A, um, is a naturally occurring variant of a taller flux, flux a paniculata. And that one has been shown to attract a great number of pollinators. It's very attractive to them. And I have to say, I planted the straight species and had barely any butterflies coming. And I had swallowtails just sitting on my Gina cultivars for 10 or 15 minutes nectaring. So that that's just one example uh, of, a, of a situation where the pollinators really do seem to be drawn. And, and that plant is multiplied in the horticulture trade, but it occurred, it, it evolved naturally. It, it wasn't manipulated. Uh, one other point to make about cultivars is that Doug Tellamy's studies seem to indicate that those that have been modified for height and for disease resistance um, are are still going to provide the benefits. It's when the most often when that foliage color has been changed or the flower form has been changed. That's when the problems really occur. Uh we have two more real quick. I'm waiting for the shade presentation. Just wanted to point out that where I live on the western shore of Southern Maryland, we have historically had a wet spring and a dry or drought during the late summer months. So when the description of the plants recommend wet or dry conditions, should we target the dry conditions? Please comment. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. Yes. If you're if you're concerned of, about drought, you may want to veer more to the to the ones that can handle that. Otherwise, you're just going to have to provide supplemental water. And the last question is: alum root deer resistant. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I noted on there. The the link to the uh, to the fact sheet will will talk. It talks very specifically about deer and rabbit resistance for for every plant. Great, great. Thank you so much. And um, anything that you want to say to wrap up before we go into the shade? Uh, let's just move right on into shade. So we have plenty of time for that. Okay, great. Scott, can you do the honors? Now we'll move on to perennials for shade. Again, we're beginning with the low growing plants and they'll be introduced in bloom sequence. The first is Allegheny Spurge, Pachysandra procumbens. This is a clumping plant about six to 10 inches tall and it will spread about one to two feet across. This can grow all the way from part shade to full shade in fact, it tolerates not only dense shade, but drought. This is an evergreen ground cover. You'll see these fragrant blossoms uh, very early in the year. They will appear in March. And you'll see these very interesting seasonal changes in the foliage. New leaves will emerge with this bright spring green color. Then they will take on a marbled pattern as they appear with the flowers. And then they develop this solid green coloration. Allegheny spurge will spread slowly to form colonies. So you can use it en masse in woodland gardens. And it also is excellent for use under trees and near foundations. A perfect substitute for the invasive Japanese pachysandra. Dwarf crested iris, iris cristata, is a low mound forming plant, six to eight inches tall. It spreads about a foot across. This likes moist soil generally, but it will tolerate drought and dense shade. 
Dwarf Crested Iris, true to its name, has the typical sword-like leaves. You'll see these charming lavender flowers in April, which attract bees and hummingbirds, and it will spread slowly by rhizomes to form fairly dense colonies. Dwarf Crested Iris can be used in borders and is very attractive in woodland gardens. Here you see it intermixed with ferns and another lovely ground cover that I'll be talking about shortly, white wood aster. Wild ginger, a serum canadense, is a lush but deciduous ground cover. It ranges from six inches to a foot tall and spreads across about a foot to a foot and a half. This will grow in part to full shade and it definitely will like moist soil. I've had to add supplemental water for this during periods of drought. Wild ginger has satiny heart-shaped leaves and serves as a larval host for the pipe vine swallowtail. You'll see these charming burgundy colored flowers in April to May that are tucked beneath the foliage. Wild ginger will spread slowly by rhizomes and you can mass it on slopes to control erosion. It's very attractive in a woodland garden, and you can use it a little more formally as an edging. Barren strawberry, GM fragaroides, is a creeping mat-forming plant. It's four to six inches tall and spreads about a foot across. This tends to like moist, humus-rich, acidic soil, and I've noted that it's a particularly effective when grown under conifers. It is evergreen. You'll see these charming yellow flowers from April to May. It does produce a fruit, but unlike the other native strawberry, this is inedible. It forms a dense mat that can choke out weeds, making it ideal for edging or rock gardens. Creeping Phlox, Phlox stolonifera, has a spreading mat forming habit. It's six to eight inches tall with the flowers and about a foot and a half across. It grows in part to full shade, moist soil, but it will tolerate some degree of drought. It begins growth with these basal leaves and then the leafy stems will creep along to form colonies. These lovely flowers appear from April to May, providing early nectar for our pollinators, and they're available in a variety of colors. Creeping phlox can be used in a woodland garden. It makes a lovely edging along a forest path, or you can combine it with other plants. Here, for example, are some sedges in a shady bed. Wild stone crop. Sedum ternatum is a prostrate mat forming plant, only about two to six inches tall, and the individual plants will spread about nine inches across. This grows in part to full shade, moist soil, but it will tolerate a certain amount of drought as well as rocky soil, and it is semi evergreen. It's interesting in that it has succulent leaves that are arranged in whorls. It has beautiful star-like flowers from April to May that attract bees, wasps, and flies. It's a perfect selection for rock gardens, and you can use it as I have under trees and shrubs. Green and gold, Chrysogonum virginianum, is a mat-forming clumping plant it's about six to eight inches tall and spreads about a foot to a foot and a half across. I originally listed this as one of the plants that could grow in a range of soil conditions. And in a conversation that Colleen and I had, she says that it does very well for her in sun. I've listed it here because for me, I found that it languished somewhat in full sun. So you can make the determination for yourself whether it would do well in full sun. I'm listing it here as a good plant for part to full shade. If you use it in sun, you would definitely want to provide it supplemental moisture. 
Green and gold has semi-evergreen foliage. These lovely yellow flowers, they're composite flowers from April to May. And then it can even bloom intermittently on into the fall, providing nectar for pollinators. Pierre is a fairly popular cultivar, and it has been singled out because of its longer period of bloom and the fact that it is more consistently evergreen. Green and gold, as I've mentioned, spreads steadily by rhizomes, creating a weed-free mat, and I've used it as edging in a formal part of my garden. Boneflower, Tiarella cordifolia, another clump forming plant, although it does have a creeping habit. It's about six to 12 inches tall with the flower stalks, spreads about one to two feet across. This grows in part to full shade. It likes moist soil, neither too wet nor too dry. I have provided supplemental water during dry periods, and it will even be evergreen in mild winters. Foam flower has heart-shaped lobed leaves and spreads by stolons. Running tapestry is a popular cultivar with this interesting speckled foliage, kind of a maroon color along the veins. This has even more of a running habit, and I've used it very effectively as a spiller in a combination planter with several native plants. It will spill over the edge. You'll see these beautiful airy flowers, giving it the name foam flower, from April to May. And these attract small bees, flies, as well as butterflies. You can use foam flower in a woodland garden. It's very attractive in rock gardens. And you could use it on slopes for erosion control. Partridge berry, Michella repens, has a creeping prostrate habit. It's only about two to four inches tall and spreads about a foot across. It grows in part to full shade, even tolerating dense shade. And it is another lovely evergreen selection. You'll see these dark buds in April and they will open into these charming white fuzzy flowers from May to July, attracting bumblebees in particular. There are paired flowers. You'll see how they are joined at the base and they will form a single red dimpled fruit. The fruit is referred to as a droop. It's fleshy. It will be on the plant from July to December and eaten by birds. Partridge berry has glossy rounded leaves. It slowly forms a dense mat, particularly useful in woodland gardens. Our local naturalist recommends that you plant partridge berry away from any competing plants in the shade and without any deep leaf cover. Moving on to some taller perennials for shade, these are going to be a foot and taller, again in bloom sequence. Jacob's Ladder, Polymonium reptans, is a mound forming plant with kind of a sprawling habit about 12 to 18 inches tall and wide. This is going to grow in part to full shade. It prefers moist soil and it's going to go dormant during drought if not kept evenly moist. Jacob's Ladder is noted for its delicate fern-like foliage with the leaves in pairs looking like a ladder. These beautiful bluish purple flowers appear from April to May, attracting many pollinators, and it can spread through reseeding. Jacob's Ladder makes a nice edging. It can serve as a ground layer in a woodland garden, and it provides an interesting contrasting texture in shady beds. May apple. Podophyllum peltatum is a spreading plant. It's about 12 to 18 inches tall. Individual plants are nine to 12 inches across. This will grow in part to full shade. It likes moist soil, although it is somewhat drought tolerant. But note that eventually in the midsummer, it will die back completely. It is an ephemeral plant. 
May apple begins its growth with umbrella-like leaves that unfurl in the spring. You'll see flowers on two-leaved plants from April to May. The flower will appear in the axle there, and it's very attractive to long-tongued bees. When pollinated, it will form this fleshy fruit, somewhat lemon-shaped, and that fruit is very attractive to box turtles. May apple can spread to form dense colonies, making it perfect for naturalizing. But because it is ephemeral, when you use it in your deciduous woodland, you'd want to interplant it with other species to compensate for that summer dormancy. Here you see it with ferns, the Allegheny spurge, that lovely evergreen ground cover that I mentioned. And uh, here it's combined with the non-native Solomon seal. White wood aster, Eurybia divericata, is a loose clumping plant, about 12 to 30 inches tall. It will spread about 30 inches across. This does well in my dry shade. It tolerates drought, shallow soil, and even heavy shade. It has lovely heart-shaped basal leaves. The flowers will appear from July to October, providing important late season nectar. Seed heads develop in October and they will offer seed for birds. White wood aster spreads vigorously so you can use it to control erosion. I use it in my shady native plant garden in my backyard. And it's also lovely as an edging for woodland paths. Let's take a look at some ferns for shade. The first is Christmas fern, Polystichum acrosticoides. This grows in circular cascading clumps. It measures about a foot tall, it spreads about one to two feet across. It will grow in part to full shade and dry to moist soil. I find that it does well in my dense shade and will tolerate drought fairly well. And importantly for its use as a ground cover, it is evergreen. You'll see these silvery scaled fiddleheads appearing in the spring to refresh the foliage. It has leathery fronds with stocking shaped pinnae leading to its name, Christmas fern. Unlike the other plants we've been discussing, will not spread by seeds, it spreads by spores. And these appear on the top part of the undersides of the fronds. You can use Christmas fern along shaded foundations or in woodland gardens, or you could use it en masse to control erosion on banks. Another wonderful fern is marginal wood fern, Dryopteris marginalis. This grows in vase-shaped clumps, about a foot and a half to two feet across and the same distance wide. It grows in part to full shade and will tolerate drought once established. Like Christmas fern, it is evergreen. You'll see these fiddle heads refreshing the foliage in the spring and it develops these deeply cut leathery fronds. On this particular fern, you'll see the sori in these characteristic linear patterns on the underside. This provides wonderful cover for toads and lizards. You can use marginal wood fern to carpet a ground layer of a woodland garden, or you could combine it with other shade-loving plants in garden beds. Here you see it with May apple, Podophyllum peltatum, the large leaf that appears at the front, and it's also intermixed with Allegheny spurge, Pachycandra procumbens. Ostrich fern, Matuchia struthiopterus, grows in upright arching clumps. This is by far one of the largest of our native ferns. It grows up to six feet tall and wide, in part to full shade, and it's definitely going to prefer moist to wet soil. You'll see these tightly curled fiddleheads in March. And I wanted to point out 
that this at the current time is considered to be the only type of fern fiddleheads that are edible. In the past, several other species were considered edible, but now it's thought that maybe they contain carcinogenic compounds. You'll see what are referred to as the sterile fronds unfurling shortly after the fiddleheads appear. And these very large ferns will provide great cover for wildlife. Then in the summer, completely separate fertile fronds, deep green, will emerge. And those will remain on the fern until March. And it's at that point that they will release their spores for multiplication. Ostrich fern is beautiful when massed with bulbs in the spring. Here it is absolutely gorgeous backlit in the spring sunshine. You can use it beneath shrubs. And here you see it uh, carpeting the ground in a moist woodland. This was at Winterthur. I can now describe some grasses and sedges for shade. The first is Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica, this is a plant with a fountaining habit. It grows about six to 12 inches tall and wide. It grows in part to full shade, dry to moist soil and tolerates heavy shade. It does fairly well in my dry shade. You'll see these very interesting inflorescences. That's the technical term for the flowers of sedges in April. And it will spread via rhizomes. Pennsylvania sedge can be used as a woodland ground cover or a grass-like ground cover in shady areas where our normal turf species won't grow. What I would recommend is to use stepping stones for any foot traffic through those areas because Pennsylvania sedge does not take foot traffic. Another native sedge is Appalachian sedge, Carex appalachica. This, rather than spreading so much by rhizomes, has a bunching habit. It grows about six inches tall, but considerably wider, about a foot to 18 inches across. It can grow in dry to moist soil and is fairly drought tolerant. Like Pennsylvania sedge, it has fairly fine textured foliage, and it serves as a larval host to skippers and satyrs. As I mentioned, it has dense mounted tufts rather than that rhizomatous spread. You'll see these inflorescences from April to May, and the resulting seed will provide food for birds and turtles. Appalachian sedge is ideal for edging under paths. Here I've used it under my native hydrangea, wild hydrangea. Very effective for soil stabilization. This is on a steep hillside at uh, Longwood Gardens. And here you can see how it's used for erosion control, even on really steep slopes. This is in our quarry shade demonstration garden. Plant and leaf sedge, Carex plantagenea, is perhaps one of the most ornamental of the native sedges. It grows about 6 to 12 inches tall, 1 to 2 feet across, and grows in part to full shade. It likes moist soil, but I have found that it does tolerate dry shade once established, and it's evergreen, even continuing on through cold temperatures, snow, and ice. As I've mentioned, it's quite ornamental. It has strap-like leaves about an inch across, much wider than the two sedges I've mentioned prior to this. They have puckered veins leading to the alternate name seersucker sedge, and it will serve as a larval host plant. These are the charming inflorescences in March, and they appear on multicolored stems. The birds will eat resulting seed. And I've been noticing that this plant develops nice offsets from short rhizomes. You can separate them from the main plant and then replant them to facilitate the spread for their use as a ground cover. This particular sedge, when grouped, can make a really striking accent in your garden. Here you see it used for erosion control on slopes, and this picture was taken in the dead of winter. Also excellent for edging, 
And to my mind, plantain leaf sedge is the ideal replacement for invasive liriope. Moving on to a somewhat taller plant, this is bottle brush grass, Elemis hystrix. This is a clump forming cool season plant. So it will begin its growth a little bit later in the growing season. It will ultimately grow about two to four feet tall and two feet wide. Interestingly, among the grass species, this one tolerates heavy shade and drought. It has strap-like leaves looking somewhat like those of bamboo. It is serving as a larval host and has these very distinctive inflorescences, maybe about six inches long. The birds eat the grain-like seed that they produce. Bottlebrush grass is really effective when massed in colonies to use as a ground cover at woodland edges. It spreads by self-seeding, and you'll see these interesting color changes of the seed heads through the growing season. Let's take a look at a woody plant for shade. This is the vine, Virginia creeper, Parthenocissus quinquifolia. It's a deciduous vine and it can spread over quite a distance, 30 to 50 feet, five to 10 feet wide. It can grow in a range of sun exposures from sun to part shade. It likes moist soil, will tolerate a certain amount of drought and heavy shade. A reminder that a Virginia creeper has palmate leaves, like the fingers of a hand. There are five leaves, unlike poison ivy, which has three. It has very subtle flowers in June, but those result in this abundant fruit in the fall. And Virginia creeper has brilliant late fall foliage. You can use Virginia creeper to cover stumps. You can use it decoratively on walls, but it's very important not to let it grow on buildings because it could damage woodwork. It does serve, however, for excellent erosion control on slopes, making it a perfect substitute for invasive winter creeper. Here are some notes on our resources for recommended native plants. As I've mentioned, if you follow the links from the handout, you will be taken to our website. And under the plants menu, you will see a selection of plants and you can pick one of them and then be taken directly to the tried and true fact sheets. These give you all of the basic characteristics of the plant that I've been describing. Also discussion of any tolerances to drought, to salt, to black walnut, whether they're resistant to rabbits or deer. And then there'll be lots of tips for growing and maintenance. You may also want to take a look at our invasive plant fact sheets. You can do that by following the links at the top of the handout. And if you're looking for substitutes, you can see how you can be taken to a tried and true fact sheet to see a great replacement plant. If you are local in the Northern Virginia area, I highly recommend that you come to visit our Master Gardener demonstration gardens, and you can get information about those and see the locations on our website, mgnv.org. For those of you who are interested in buying native plants here in the Northern Virginia area, the best resource for that information is at the Plant Nova Natives website. Not only do they have a list of year-round native-only sellers, but in the spring and the fall, they will list seasonal native plant sales. If you are attending this presentation from other areas, other states, I highly recommend that you check either with your local extension agent, or you can go to websites for your state native plant society. Welcome back. Please stick around. Um, oh, Elaine is here live to answer questions. And uh, currently, we only have three questions in the queue. But if you have questions that you'd like to have answered, please feel free to add them to the Q&A module that it, you'll 
be able to see at the bottom of your window. Um, and Howard, I see your hand raised. I think I'm going to uh, ask Elaine if she can uh, answer the existing questions and then we will come to you. So if other folks have questions, you can either put them in the Q&A or at this point, I would say you could raise your hand through the reactions uh, module at the bottom, um, I, I think, where you should be able to have the option to raise your hand. So uh, the first question we have is, what would be the best way to start wild ginger from seed? Okay, I have to admit, I haven't done a lot of growing plants, uh, native plants, from seed. I usually get them in, in small uh, containers from native-only sellers. Um, we actually, on our Master Gardener's website, have a little bit of information about starting from seed, including a link to um, a really great presentation by um, an Audubon at Home group. There's some folks that do all of our propagating uh, for a native plant society in Northern Virginia. A really helpful website I've found uh, is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center website. If you put in the name of a plant, in this case, wild ginger, and you go to the bottom of the very long detailed description for most of the plants, there is a subsection of the text that talks about propagation methods. Because the tricky thing with some of these plants is that they're going to need to go to go through what's called stratification. They need to go through a period of cold. Um, they would this would be happening naturally if the plant if the seed just landed somewhere outside, it would go through that process. If you have, on the other hand, a packet of seeds and you want to start growing a plant, some of them, can grow fairly easily without that stratification, but others do require a certain period. Sometimes it's um, 90 days, three months of going through that cold before they're um, able to germinate. Others need to have other processes that will simulate what would be happening if the seed went through the digestive system of a bird. And that can be replicated either by some ticking, some marking on the seed, or a kind of a chemical treatment. So um, I can't answer specific for, for each plant, but going to a site like that um, could be very helpful in explaining how to do that. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is creeping flocks and moss flocks in, in the same genus? Yes, um, I can think of four different types of phlox. There's the phlox subulata, the moss phlox, which it has that needle-like foliage, very dense mat, uh, stolonifera, and then phlox divericata is another one for woodlands. Um, stolonifera is going to spread at, true to its uh, species name. It spreads by those above-ground stolons. And um, I referred to phlox paniculata, um, which is is a much I, a much taller plant for sun. It's going to grow more like four feet tall, so I wasn't listing it as a ground cover type plant, but that's um, a very lovely um, flowering plant, great for late summer into early fall uh, for pollinators, uh, lots of butterflies like it. The, the Gina cultivar that I mentioned is for Phlox paniculata. That is referred to as either... Um, garden flocks or maybe fall flocks. Great. Uh, what type of maintenance chores do you recommend for native-based garden landscapes? Well, I'll tell you, I have given a talk that is called Caring for Your Native Plants Garden. And I'm in the process of developing website resources that 
that parallel that presentation. That presentation, maybe Scott can find it and put the, put the link in the chat. That's available on our Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website. What I do in that presentation is to go through season by season and list all the gardening tasks. So for winter, um, I'm talking about what you can do to protect your plants from some of the storms that we've been having, how to handle uh, conditions with snow, maybe salt problems um, coming up from, from the roadsides or for treatment on a sidewalk or driveways, um, which plants should be pruned in the winter, um, how to plan for your new garden and what types of um, considerations you'd have when you're deciding what to put in your garden. For spring, we'd be looking at when to cut back plants, when to trim them, how you should really be holding off on that garden maintenance in the spring because you want to allow the pollinators to re-emerge, how to um, cut plants so you can ha uh, create habitat for, for stem nesting bees, um, how to propagate plants depending on their root systems, then on into the summer when to prune, how to keep plants, um, all, all the seed heads remaining through the through the fall. So season by season, I take you through. So if you want to listen to another presentation, it's a, a 90 minute long talk um, on exactly what to do and what seasons. Right now, literally just this week, we've introduced the parallel resources for winter and I will be developing them for each of the, the other seasons. So I hope you'll find those resources helpful. That's fabulous. I'm so I'm completely blown away by your encyclopedic knowledge. It's I'm I'm not a master gardener. I'm not even really a gardener. I'm it, I'm just so impressed and and so very grateful to have you with us. Thank you. I got very excited um, developing some charts because I realized I couldn't find them anywhere. Like, okay, which native plants need to be pruned when? And how do you do it? Do you just prune lightly? Do you prune heavily? Some plants, like for example, that wild hydrangea can be cut almost to the ground and, and will regrow three to five feet. Uh, when do you go about dividing plants? What about deadheading? So I created detailed charts for the plants that are part of the resources that go um, with that talk. So um, I hope people will find that helpful. Phenomenal. Uh, so can I gather spores from wild ferns? Uh, yes, there I've I gave a talk on native ferns and in the resources, I list a couple of very specific websites that tell you exactly how you could grow uh, go about growing uh, ferns from the spores. Now, ferns have a different kind of a life cycle from our other um, herbaceous plants. They have different generations. And so it, it gets a little bit trickier. And, and I am certainly not an expert on that. But that talk that I gave on ferns um, has that very specific information uh, 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 referring to those other websites. Great. Uh, do you find that pollinators readily come into the deep shade to nectar as they do in the sun? Uh, pollinators are, are really going to be more attracted to the sun. Um, a lot of them just um, that the sun is going to warm, warm them up and, and be good for their particular metabolisms. Um, so when we think of a quote pollinator garden, we're usually thinking about one that's planted in pretty much the full, the full sun. But um, they they will come. Um, some of the caterpillars are uh, the 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 adults will do the. Um, what am I trying to say? They, with the butterflies and the moths, the adults will be coming for the for the nectar. Then they'll lay. Um, their eggs, and then the caterpillars can even emerge in in some shadier conditions, and um, and bees will be drawn to flowers in in different conditions as well. Okay, uh, is there a native grass that tolerates some foot traffic? Uh, well, the grasses are going to be taller than the sedges. That's why I mentioned the sedges as more of the more of the ground covers. 
Um, that, Is there a sedge that tolerates foot traffic? Well, interestingly, people may want to check out one of the most recent reports by Mount Cuba Center. Uh, they have just done a report on Carex. That's the, the genus. C-A-R-E-X is the genus for the sedges. And they're looking at them not only for uh, do they grow in the sun or the shade? The ones that I'm most familiar with are going to tend to grow more in the shade, but some of them are somewhat sun tolerant. They're also looking to see which ones might be mown, which ones could you could actually run a mower over them. They could tolerate that and in a sense um, serve as a um, a turf grass replacement. Actually, now that I think about it, there is one grass that is also being studied um, as a possible turf replacement, and that is um, poverty oat grass. Danthonia spicata is the scientific name. It grows in nice little dense clumps. They're not especially tall. So when the seed heads are not there, you can actually walk on it. It's a little bit springy. It has a very nice feel um, underfoot. And it has some really pretty little kind of crinkly, spirally um, extra uh, extensions of the foliage that just give it a really a appealing look. It will send up the seed heads, but it those could be could be mown down, and and you'd only need to do that uh, very very briefly. It's not going to be like a turf grass where you would have to be mowing it all the time. Um, some people were looking at another grass that's really more native to the Midwest, um, which is buffalo grass. Um, Let's see. I'm, I'm trying to think of its scientific name. Dactyloides is the is the species name. Uh, the the genus name escapes me at the moment. But that one I think is more native to the Midwest. I think we found that um, it it wasn't going to be as good for the East Coast um, region. But people could look could look into that. Either one of those poverty oak grass, especially. Okay, so it is eight fifty-five. We generally go till about till nine o'clock. It looks like if we if we have you answer the rest of these questions, we might run a little bit over. I'm wonder. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, are you okay? With I, I'm available. That's that's fine. Beautiful. Okay, so how can we find out about your upcoming talk in May, comparing natives to nativars? Okay, um, we have very frequent classes that we give our particular unit of master gardeners. They're not given every single Friday, but many Fridays. Now, some of the presentations are not going to be my subject area. We also give talks on things like composting, uh, making use of your leaves. And for those folks who also enjoy vegetable gardening, there are excellent classes by master gardeners who are expert in that area. I give a about a one talk every six weeks. So um, I'm going to be giving a talk in March on native shrubs as replacements for the overused foundation plants that we're seeing, this limited palette of plants. I'm going to be talking about lots and lots of shrubs. Um, in April, um, I'm going to be talking about native trees. In May, I'm going to talk about the cultivars and the species. So what you do about a month ahead of time is, is to just look at um, under the education menu tab on our website, just look under RSVP for, for classes and you'll see the classes that are listed and you can register, they're, they're all free. Um, we also, if you follow us on Facebook, you'll see announcements of the classes um, a, a bit in advance as, as well. So that's where you would go to our mgnv.org website. And I've given maybe 20 classes on a wide variety of native plants. And you can find those um, both on our YouTube channel and on the website as, as well. Uh, I've given talks for different seasons, for, for different categories of plants, for sun, for shade, for, uh, war, for um, 
dry conditions for wet conditions. So I, it's always about native plants, but it's looking at it from, from a different take every time. Wonderful, wonderful. Is it particularly difficult to grow taller, shade-tolerant natives in acid soil? Example, under conifers. Okay. Um, I'm not really an expert about under under conifers. There are some that, that do well. But, um, I mean, people think of the pine needles as being acid, but they really don't add that much um, acidity to the soil it, itself. Um, and in fact, growing in a forest condition, you're going to tend to have more acid soil. Our trees um, prefer um, acid soil conditions. It's it's the lawn, the grasses that like the um, the alkaline conditions. So, uh, so acidic soil isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. There are some native plants that are going to require the soil, the pH of the soil, to be particularly acidic. Those are plants that are referred to as ericaceous. They're in the heath family. They would include the rhododendrons, the azaleas, um, blueberry. They're going to, most plants, native plants, will grow in the pH range of 6 to 7.0. The acidic range is going to be below that, and some of them are going to require pH even as low as 4.5 to 5.5. So um, you can get all the information about the pH um, on the fact sheets for any given plant. Great. Uh, my own experience with one fern is that it was so very that it was very aggressive. I'm scared to use it. They also populate like crazy, and their roots are so difficult to dig up. Your thoughts? Uh, I wonder if it was hay scented fern that you're thinking of. Um, in my talk on on native ferns, I I do mention that that's one that's particularly aggressive. There's another one um, with a genus named Teridium, I think it is, that, that was quite, quite aggressive. But um, royal fern, sensitive fern, um, ostrich fern, uh, the, the Christmas fern, the marginal wood fern, uh, lady fern, those, those should really be relatively well behaved. And if you want more details, you, you can check out that particular presentation. Great. Someone asks, what is your title again? I'm I'm a master gardener volunteer. I am not paid. Um, I just volunteer my time for the master gardener program. And I, I spoke about uh, Doug Tallamy being my hero, just given the particular state of the environment right now. This is a topic that I am passionate about. So I, gi I give a lot of my time, but Master Gardener, Extension Master Gardener is, is my title. I happen to be based at the Arlington Alexandria unit um, in Northern Virginia. Great. And are MGNAs planning on educating, quote, yard guys, unquote, urban landscape crews about natives and their care? Um, the, the group uh, here in Northern Virginia, where I'm speaking from, that really tries to um, connect both with uh, landscapers and those crews is a group referred to as Plant Nova Natives. Th that's a group um, here in Northern Virginia. There is a broader extension in the state of Virginia called Grow um, Virginia natives. And I think though the little subsets, the little groups in the Richmond area, in um, in the Tidewater area, in the mountain areas, each of those groups is probably trying to do the same thing, to have conferences, symposia, where they speak directly with, with landscapers to try to, to teach them about the proper way to um, to do the landscaping. For example, we want to avoid what we refer to as mulch, uh, the mulch volcanoes, those huge piles um, that look like a big heap um, around trees, for example. Um, I'm gonna ask that we add no more questions, please, to the Q&A, because we're already over time. So uh, now we have four questions remaining. 
Uh, one is, do you have any native plant recommendations to robustly compete with the invasive species? Stilt grass and the very challenging invasive ephemeral, ephemeral lesser celandine. Celandine? Lesser celandine, yes. Um, some of these, you, like that plant, it, you just would really want to do what you could to eradicate it and then um, and then plant a, a replacement plant. Um, with with regard to something like the stilt grass, um, in my talk on um, on on native grasses and sedges, I had a whole section. I wrote an addendum document which had a lot of discussion about what you could try to do to um, compete with with those invasives. Okay. And uh, would Virginia creeper be used for climbing trees? Okay, it it can climb the trees. It it's not going to be quite as uh, problematic as English ivy. That that and um, the um, the other um, creeping creeping one that I mentioned. Those are really going to be problematic. They're going to choke the tree. They're so heavy. They're going to carpet the the branches and the leaves and prevent the plant from photosynthesizing and the weight of those plants can actually pull them down. Virginia creeper is not as problematic, but um, I've heard Doug tell me say that really you you don't want the vines to be growing up on the trees. They're, they're going to, um, to, to make it a, a little less easy for them to get the, the light for photosynthesis that they need. Okay. Is barren strawberry the same as mock strawberries? Mock strawberry, uh, it, my understanding is that that is actually kind of, of a weedy plant. I'm trying to think of the scientific name, but it's escaping me at the moment. But um, the difference between the native strawberry, uh, Fragaria virginiana, is the native strawberry has an edible fruit and a white flower. The the weedy uh, mock strawberry that was sometimes referred to, I think, as Indian strawberry, has a yellow a yellow flower. Now the barren strawberry also has a yellow flower, but it's it's not a weedy um, plant. And last but not least is why is it called Christmas fern? Okay, it's called Christmas fern for two reasons. One is that it is evergreen, so it will be seen around the, the winter holiday. I also mentioned that those pinnae, the little leaflets of the of the fern, um, the pinnae are the, the little leaflets that are the subsections of the whole frond. They are said to resemble Christmas stockings. Oh, how fun. So... Elaine, thank you. This is <laughs> remarkable, really, truly extraordinary. For everyone who's still here, a uh, reminder that we will be posting tonight's presentation and Q&A on our YouTube channel. Scott, if you're able to put the YouTube channel um, link in the chat, that would be awesome. We'll probably be following up with everyone with an email to the link uh as well and it's just been such a delight do you have anything that you'd like to say to wrap up the evening elaine um just if you're like me you'll enjoy reading doug telemy's books you'll enjoy listening to any presentations he he gives and uh, check out his um, homegrown native par uh, nat national park we all individually in our own gardens can be doing something uh, for the environment. Wonderful. And Scott, I don't know if you have any closing words. Scott was not feeling well this evening. So, oh, I'm so sorry. No problem. <laughs> my, internet, my internet isn't feeling well either, which is why I've had my camera off. It's oh. been lagging on me. I'm, I'm kind of uh, surprised that you all weren't complaining about a lag on the presentation. I'm glad that worked out. But yeah, thanks again for everybody for being here. And we are here doing this every Thursday night at this time, 7 to 9 East Coast time. So um, you'll all get emails announcing 
future events. Uh, we would love to have you join and help us share and spread the word. And as Mira mentioned earlier, if anybody has any recommendations on other content that you think we should be sharing with folks, feel free to reply to one of those emails or hit us up on social media or whatever. Which would be great. Thank you all. We hope to see you all again soon and uh, have, have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone. Happy gardening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>